Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about kissing bugs and stink bugs, and we'd like to thank John Bruce for suggesting this topic. And this week, we have an interview with Dan from Mr. Sparky, and he has some electrical tips. You can get a free download of our new ebook. Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Book 14, from July 22nd to July 26th on Amazon. Entomologists think predatory bugs like the kissing bug that feeds on blood dates back around 200 million years. Hmm. Charles Darwin made one of the first reports about kissing bugs in the 1800s when he was sailing on the Beagle for five years. In his diary, he talks about a kissing bug that he caught, and one of the sailors would let it feed on his finger. Why? <laughs> well, I guess there's not much to do on a ship right, exactly. in the 1800s. <laughs> he said it caused no pain, and it took about 10 minutes to go from flat as a wafer to a globular form. And he said it was ready to feed again in about two weeks. Hmm. Darwin also studied the bugs by letting them feed on him, because at the time, he wasn't aware that kissing bugs can carry a parasite that can infect humans. And later in life, he suffered from chronic vomiting and stomach pain and died from heart disease. And some researchers think it could have been Chagas disease transmitted by kissing bugs. Hmm. In 1909, Carlos Chagas, a scientist, discovered the parasite in triatamine bugs, also called kissing bugs or vampire bugs, that causes the parasitic disease, now called Chagas disease. I was wondering how kissing bugs became a topic for us, but now that I know that they're also called vampire bugs, <laughs> it makes sense, JC. Texas A&M University says most kissing bugs are dark brown or black with an oval-shaped body, and they can grow a half an inch to an inch long, and mm. they have a needle-like mouth part to draw blood. And this long, thin mouth part is usually folded back under its head and body until it's ready to draw a blood meal. Yuck. And you should check them out online to see what they look like. Nope. When kissing bugs feed on blood from animals like armadillos, raccoons, opossums, and rodents, some of these animals are infected with a parasite that causes Chagas disease. Hmm. The parasite is then carried in the insect's guts and their waste. So you won't get Chagas disease from a kissing bug bite. But if the insect defecates on your skin and you're scratching the bug bite, you can spread the parasites to the open skin, or you can get that waste on your fingers and then get infected by touching your eyes or your mouth. Yeah. There are different species of kissing bugs. One entomologist said in the U.S., the species here usually defecates 15 minutes or longer after a blood meal. So the chance of getting the parasites on your skin is low. Oh, good news. <laughs> Many species of kissing bugs in Central and South America defecate while they're feeding. So the <laughs> chance of spreading the parasites into the bug bite or having the waste on your hands is higher. Also, the amount of kissing bugs is much higher in homes in Central and South America. And the chances of food prep areas being contaminated is higher. In the U.S., kissing bugs have been identified primarily in the lower half of the U.S. If you get the parasite, the disease can be mild, causing a fever, headaches, a rash, or vomiting. You can get a lump on your skin or have a swollen eyelid. But you need to get treatments to kill the parasite and manage the symptoms. If it's left untreated, the symptoms can occur 10 to 20 years later, and yeah. it can turn chronic in 20 to 30 percent of people who are infected which can cause enlargement of the heart muscles, the colon, and esophagus, and it can cause congestive heart failure in some people. The World Health Organization says Chagas disease affects about 6 million people in Central and South America and causes about 12,000 deaths a year. Hmm. Chagas disease isn't common in the U.S. Not all animals that the kissing bug feeds on has the parasite, 
And if the bug has the parasite, its waste has to make contact with open skin, like a cut or the bite site, or your eyes or your mouth. Hmm. The National Library of Medicine says kissing bugs are attracted to light, CO2, lactic acid and sweat, water vapor, and heat radiating from people and animals, along with some other chemicals. They usually feed at night and are drawn to a person's face from CO2, heat, and water vapor, and they have heat sensors so they can locate your blood vessels under your skin. Lovely. (laughs) Wow. Kissing bugs are drawn to your home because of outside lights or lights from inside your home. And then you just said lights. (laughs) Yes, they're drawn to lights. And then they pick up on CO2 and other chemicals inside your home and they try to find a way in. Mm Mm-hmm. To help prevent kissing bugs and other pests from getting inside your home, you should have a yearly routine of checking the exterior of your home for any gaps or openings, and then seal those up with caulk or expanding foam. You want to repair and replace weather strip, check all the existing caulk around windows and doors, check around pipes or cables coming into your home. You should repair screens or put up screens in windows or doors that you keep open. And then put screens over or under vents in attics or anywhere you have an opening or a vent. Don't have piles of wood or piles of rock against your home. They say that they like to congregate there. Hmm. If you're in an area that's known to have a problem with kissing bugs like parts of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, move. keep your pets inside at night and bring in their water and food bowls. Dogs and cats can get infected by eating an infected bug or licking their fur if a kissing bug has defecated on their fur. And you should be checking your pets with long hair to catch any kissing bugs in their fur before they come inside. Wear gloves and remove them outside. Mm -hmm. The CDC says synthetic pyrethroid bug sprays and perimeter sprays around the outside of your home has been used successfully to reduce kissing bugs from getting inside your home. Hmm. Be careful when you're spraying insecticides like this outside. Pyrethroids are toxic to honeybees and cats. You would want to spray on a windy day by plants that bees are visiting. And the Pet Poison Hotline says keep cats away from any area that you're spraying with pyrethrins or pyrethroids until the surfaces are dry. Hmm. The Foundation for Biomedical Research says many bugs, including kissing bugs, are attracted to light in the blue, violet, and ultraviolet range. LEDs in the yellow range, 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin, are less attractive to bugs. Hmm. So you can change your outside lights to soft white. You're looking for 2,700 K on the package. Okay. There's an insect trap called Dynatrap. It's D-Y-N-A capital T-R-A-P. This uses UV light and CO2 to attract bugs. You plug it in outside and it works all day attracting mosquitoes and other insects drawn to light and CO2. So does it kill them? It tra- So it, it has a fan. So they're attracted to it. It sucks them down into this basket where they're trapped mm-hmm. and then they dehydrate and die. Okay. <laughs> Texas A&M University says never touch a kissing bug with your bare hands. Use a glove or a plastic bag to get it outside. Don't smash kissing bugs on any surfaces inside your home. And clean any surfaces that came in contact with a kissing bug thoroughly with a bleach solution. Okay. Another pest is stink bugs. And there's quite a few species in the U.S., But the brown marmorated stink bug is one of the most destructive to crops, and it's a nuisance for many homeowners. Marmorated? Marmorated. It's M-A-R-M-O-R-A-T-E-D. It means marble-like or streaked in appearance. Mm. They're usually shades of brown with a shield-shaped body, and they grow to about a half an inch long. They're native to Asia, and entomologists think that they first arrived in the U.S. in the 1990s. And they're not a problem to humans. They don't bite or spread disease, although some people do have an allergic reaction to the chemicals that they release or the body parts if they're crushed. If you crush a stink bug or if the stink bug feels threatened, it releases a fluid that some people say smells like a skunk or rotting fruit or a blend of ammonia and sulfur, 
or cilantro. <laughs> Quite a variety. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says the brown marmorated stink bug is now in over 40 states, and it feeds on apples, peaches, apricots, figs, beans, corn, tomatoes, soybeans, and other crops. Hmm. It pierces the fruit or food with its mouth parts, which damages it, making it unsellable. Some farms have lost up to 90% of their nectarines and 50% of their apples. The University of Florida says during a big outbreak of stink bugs in 2010, over $37 million worth of fruit was damaged. Wow. Terrible. In fall, as temperatures drop, stink bugs are looking for shelter to go dormant for the winter. And when they find shelter like a garage or a shed or an opening into your home's basement or a hole to get into a space between your walls, they release a pheromone that attracts other stink bugs. You can have hundreds or thousands of stink bugs in your home if there's a large population in your area. Yeah, it's amazing. And entomologists working with homeowners found thousands in a few homes that he was studying. A wildlife biologist in Maryland counted all of the stink bugs that he eliminated from his home, and after six months, the total was (laughs) 26,200. A Virginia entomologist counted over 30,000 stink bugs in a shed that was infested. Yuck. Be traumatic, wouldn't it? Uh, To say the least. (laughs) The University of Maryland recommends weatherizing and sealing your home before fall to prevent an infestation of stink bugs. They say seal any gaps into your home, seal around and under siding, check your weather strip and screens, Cover any openings to your attic with insect screen and get a fireplace cap with a screen. If you find individual bugs in your home, take them outside and put them in a bucket with soapy water to kill them. If you find or have large amounts, use a vacuum and then take them outside (laughs) immediately and pour them into a five-gallon bucket with soapy water. And then once they're dead, they recommend putting them into a compost pile. Especially if you have thousands. Yeah. Yeah, that's for the compost bin. If you have a vacuum with a bag, you're going to have less odor in your vacuum because when they're scared, yeah. they, they release the smell. <laughs> so if you have a canister yeah. style, an old wet and dry vac would probably be good for stink bugs. Or just move. <laughs> I spoke to Harris. It's H-A-R-R-I-S. They have a ready-to-use stink bug killer. It comes in a one-gallon container with a spray nozzle and a hose. Their formula is water-based, odorless, and non-staining. The water-based insecticides will work after they're dry, killing bugs after they make contact with the treated areas. Their stink bug killer keeps working for weeks after it's applied. It can be used inside or outside. It's EPA registered for use in homes with people and pets. That's good. Iowa State University says ready-to-use insecticides are the only type of bug killer a homeowner should use inside their home. And they say make sure to follow all label instructions carefully. You can check out Harris at pfharris.com. It's just the letter P, the letter F, H-A-R-R-I-S dot com. Orange Guard is an insect killer that uses orange peel extract. And this can be used inside for insects or outside as a border control. It's O-R-A-N-G-E, capital G-U-A-R-D. Diatomaceous earth is a non-toxic powder that can be used under baseboards and appliances to control insects. It's the fossilized remains of tiny algae that cut up the thin, waxy, protective layer on insects, causing them to dehydrate and die. Bonide, it's B-O-N-I-D-E, they have a stink bug trap that uses a non-toxic lure. It lasts up to four weeks, and you can use this inside or outside. Mm. Researchers at the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences say the best way to trap and kill stink bugs in your home is to get a large foil roasting pan, fill it a quarter of the way up with water, and then add some dish soap. Position a desk lamp above it and focus the light into the pan. They say if you leave the light on all night, it's going to attract stink bugs and they're going to drown in the soapy water. And they said in their tests, it worked better than the store-bought traps. You just have to wake up to a pan full of dead stink bugs. (laughs) 
That's gross. Scientists are studying if releasing the Asian samurai wasp would be a good way to control stink bugs. The wasp is very tiny, about the size of the stink bug eggs, and this wasp lays their eggs in the stink bug eggs, and then the larva eats the eggs to kill it. Gross. Although the cane toad was introduced into Australia in 1935, they thought that they would control the cane beetle that was damaging sugarcane crops. Why? Because they have the same name? (laughs) Right. But they found out that these toads prefer almost every other insect. And the 3,000 toads turned into millions. Don't just start with two. (laughs) two Like in a restricted area. So they say it reduced the insect population and reduced the food available for native animals that need insects for food. The toads are also poisonous, so animals trying to eat them can be poisoned. An adult cane toad can kill an average-sized dog in 15 minutes. This was not a good plan. (laughs) Right. The Smithsonian Magazine said in 1955, a pet dealer accidentally released 100 cane toads in Florida. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission says that cane toads are now well established in Florida and they're regarded as a threat to native species and pets. A toad sitting in a dog's water bowl can leave enough poison to make your dog ill. And if dogs and cats are biting or playing with a toad, they can get poisoned. And if they eat a toad, there's enough poison that they could die very quickly. Wow. The Florida Wildlife Commission recommends that any residents seeing cane toads should kill them. And if you're in Florida or Hawaii and have kids or pets, you should probably do some research on these. Right. I spoke to Mr. Sparky about some electrical tips for older homes. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing today, JC? Real good. Thank you. Cindy and I were hoping you could help us with some electrical tips for homeowners who are moving into an older home. I sure can. Um, The best place to start is in the buying process. If you're purchasing an older home, I highly suggest um, you have, number one, have it inspected. Um, But number two, really and truly, most people should have an electrical inspection done by a qualified uh, electrician. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, the typical home inspector is more or less a jack of all trades. In other words, he can inspect a roof. He can look at a electrical panel. He can, uh, you know, check out the foundation, etc. But he's really not an electrical specialist. Probably the best way to sum up why you should have an electrical inspection done is actually I had an inspection done on my home that I purchased about three years ago. And um, the inspector that did the job did a fine job. But come to find out, I actually had a Federal Pacific electrical panel in my home. And Federal Pacific uh, electrical panels were actually recalled in the 80s. And the reason they were recalled was that the uh, circuit breakers themselves were not tripping uh, when there was an electrical short. So they were causing fires and other types of uh, electrical issues in the home. Scary. Uh, Yeah, very scary. And uh, so I highly suggest anyone that is purchasing an older home have an electrical inspection. Some of the other things you may run into is aluminum wiring. Aluminum wiring was uh, utilized in the 70s. And it's it's really dangerous to have in your home. Uh, there's a, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, if it does indeed get shorted out, it tends to heat up very quickly and cause fires. Very predominant in the uh, uh, mobile home or manufactured home industry back in the 70s, but has been phased out and everyone has gone back to copper, which is, of course, the best. And if you've moved into an older home with aluminum wiring and you want to replace switches or outlets, you need to get a device that's marked CO slash ALR. You can't use a standard switch or outlet? That's correct. Um, That can lead to even more issues. So the the best thing, again, going back to the inspection is, you know, it's going to cost a very nominal fee to have a qualified electrician come out 
and do a safety inspection on your home. We actually have a standard safety inspection and Mr. Sparky that we do on every job. It looks looks over the entire electrical system in your home, double checks for such things as uh, outdated equipment, overloaded circuits. That's probably number two on the list of uh, issues that most people have in an older home. Uh, maybe the previous homeowner was a do-it-yourselfer and, and uh, added several outlets to an existing circuit. Uh, a typical circuit just so you know, can carry about 1,800 watts safely without tripping the uh, breaker. That's a 15-amp circuit. Okay. So if you have one hair dryer on that circuit, a lot of hair dryers are 1,800 watts. Right. So with one hair dryer, you're, you're at the limits of a circuit. So if you have a, a hair dryer and a toaster on that same circuit, uh, you've overloaded the circuit. <laughs> so you have to dry your hair in the dark to be safe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. And, and they'll have trouble. The circuit breaker will flip off and they'll go and they, you know, it's a, typically it's one. And they'll go and they'll flip it back on. And maybe it feels a little bit warm. But what they don't realize is, it's not just the circuit breaker that's warm. It's the wiring leading to that circuit breaker that gets warm as well when it's overloaded. So a uh, very dangerous situation. Interesting. So what are some things homeowners should be thinking about or checking when they first move into an older home? Probably the first thing is check and make sure that your electrical panel is labeled. Okay. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, panels are labeled. They may it may be very old labeling, may not uh, be able to make it out. Uh, that was a case in in the house I purchased that I talked to you about. And uh, number two, check that they're labeled correctly. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it, uh, if you uh, switch off a circuit breaker that says garage and and the kitchen lights go out, it's probably not labeled correctly. <laughs> Right. So check all of your outlets, uh, check your circuit breakers, make sure you flip them off, flip them back on, make sure they all operate properly. If you do have uh, GFCIs in your uh, bathroom area, your kitchen area, make sure those operate. Hit the little test button, the little button pops out, you push it back in. Uh, those actually should be checked about monthly. Okay. Uh, no one really does that on a on a consistent basis, but really and truly, they should be checked. That's a uh, it's an important measure against shocks. Are there any projects you suggest that a homeowner shouldn't be doing themselves? Well, I'm a little biased, but you know, I think anything where you have to go to the electrical panel and turn off a circuit breaker to work on. I think should be handled by a qualified electrician. And I know people like to save money. I'm the same way. I like to save money when I can. But the money that you save trying to do an electrical project yourself, it's not going to do you any good if you're dead. It does not take a major shock to stop your heart. So what are some other things homeowners should be checking when they first move into an older home? Probably the first and foremost would be smoke detectors. Okay. Uh, make sure that uh, your smoke detectors operate and that you have them installed properly uh, in the correct locations. There should be one outside of every uh, sleeping room, one in the living area, one in the kitchen area. Uh, if you have a basement, of course, in the basement. Our professional uh, electricians install smoke alarms all the time. And uh, it's a very easy process. It's not a major project, but it is a very important project to get done. If you have any type of uh, natural gas, furnace, uh, fuel oil, etc., or natural gas, uh, hot water heater, a boiler in your home, you're going to want to have uh, carbon monoxide detectors in your home as well. Very important to test those and clean those. Um, the shelf life on a uh, smoke detector is 10 years. That's the maximum uh, lifespan of a smoke detector. So your smoke detector may be out of date. And there's a simple way to check that. You okay. Remove it from the ceiling or wherever it's mounted. 
look at the back of it, and it will have a date on the back of the smoke detector. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors typically have a much less lifespan, typically three to five years, depends on the manufacturer. But also, same thing, you take them off, you look on the back, and there's a date on the back of that, and you should not exceed that date. They need to be replaced. Test your batteries. Make sure they're mounted in the correct areas of your home. There are codes as to location and quantity of smoke detectors and also carbon monoxide detectors. Dan, I was wondering whether you could give me some information about Mr. Sparky. Sure. We've got uh, approximately 100 locations uh, throughout the United States with 36 franchise owners currently. We've got uh, several with multiple locations. One of the key things about Mr. Sparky is the ongoing training all of our people receive. Uh, we have our own internal training, online training system. It's called uh, Success Academy. We also have in-person training. All of our owners actually have training at least weekly for their employees on um, customer service, new innovations in the industry. Uh, they cover the whole gamut of training. So it's a very training-based organization from top to bottom. And if I wanted to learn more about Mr. Sparky, where would I go? Sure, you can go to uh, mrsparky.com. That lists all of our locations. It's a relatively new website that we've uh, developed in the last couple of years. Uh, I take you to our locations, introduce you to some of our owners. Oh, of course, you can always call the local uh, Mr. Sparky in your, in your area. It's a great organization with great people from top to bottom. We have an on-time guarantee, uh, so people don't have to wait around all day for, the, uh, for our technicians to show up, which is fantastic. Customer service is number one. We have a, a UN guarantee, uh, so the customer is guaranteed they're going to be happy. There's no way they can lose working with Mr. Sparky. And it's M-I-S-T-E-R-S-P-A-R-K-Y dot com? That's correct. All right. Well, I appreciate your time, Dan. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. That was a great interview. Yeah, I like all the training that's required for their electricians. Mm -hmm. And they've been very helpful with some questions I've had for projects and podcast topics. Do you have anything else to add? Have a yearly routine to keep your home sealed up from insects. Don't crush kissing bugs or stink bugs inside your home. And if you see a cane toad, kill it. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our ebooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Books 1 through 13. And from July 22nd to July 26th, you can download a free copy of our 14th book on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five star rating and review. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at Fixit Co host. You can follow us on Instagram, Fixit Home Improvement. And you can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Do you have